The message I'm going to give today, I could go on for about five million rabbit trails, so I got to try to keep a little bit focused here. <laughs> and so I don't want to get off going because there's so much good stuff that uh, we could go anywhere here. I titled this uh, Pathway to Glory. And um, the Word of God, right from the beginning, talks about how God wanted his wanted uh, his people to rule the earth. He wanted them to go out, go forth and take and, and take charge of the entire earth. Everything in it, they would be, you know, everything that whatever would have looked like. I don't know what it would have looked like if Adam and Eve would have, you know, wouldn't have take, got sidetracked there for a few minutes. I don't know exactly what it would look like, but all commerce and everything that was going on, whatever that would look like, would have been kingdom. It would have been all done according to the kingdom of God. And I believe, I still, I believe he still wants us to do that. I believe the, that the earth is there for us to take as his church through the work of the Holy Spirit. That is the job of the Holy Spirit, to build his kingdom on earth through his church, to build a strong church, to build a, a church that is in the likeness of Jesus, that is, that, that uh, acts in the same way, does the same things, works through the same power, and has the same um, destiny that Jesus has. Had to bring freedom to the captives and to, and to save the world. So I'm going to start in, which one do I want to go to first? First Peter 3. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, suffering. Pastor uh, Terry has been doing some of that and doing a really good job, but I'm going to cover some things that, he has, that he's gone over and some other things. Um, but I want to, when I get finished here, I want to try to bring this to a point of just exactly what we have. Just exactly what God has given to us. It is absolutely incredible. It is, it is just amazing what God has done for a bunch of fallen people. And he is going to reign and rule on this earth through his church. And so in 1 Peter uh, chapter 3, verse 18 to 22, I'm going to start there and then I'll kind of make my way back to these first two verses. I guess I should open my Bible. That'll probably be a good way to start. 1 Peter 3, 18. Okay. So Christ suffered for our sins once and for all time. He never sinned, but he died for sinners to bring you safely home to God. He suffered physical death, but he was raised to life in the spirit. So he went and preached to the spirits in prison, those who disobeyed God long ago when God waited patiently while Noah was building his boat. Only eight people were saved from drowning in that terrible flood. And the water is a picture of, of baptism, which now saves you, not by removing dirt from your body, but as a response to God from a clean conscience. It is effective because of a resurrection of Jesus Christ. I'm just going to stop there for one second. Even in, in this passage, it shows you the grace and mercy of God. He went into hell and preached to the rebellious people who would not listen to him, who were destroyed by the flood. How much does God want the whole earth to be saved? How much does God want the kingdom of heaven to be full of people? How much does God want every person to know him and have everlasting life in his presence? He, it, it, throughout the, it just over and over and over again, it just talks about the mercy and grace of God. So number, verse 22, now Christ has gone to heaven. He is seated in the place of honor next to God and all the angels and authorities and powers accept his authority. I want you to just kind of keep that verse in the back of your mind because I want to come back to that uh, right near the end. And then I'm going to go to Matthew uh, 20 and 23. Okay. Matthew 
you told him in 19. No wonder it didn't make sense. Okay, so Jesus, um, when the mother, oh, let's start at 20. When the mother of James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to Jesus with her sons, she knelt respectfully, respectfully to ask a favor. What is your request, he asked. She replied, in your kingdom, please let my two sons sit at places of honor next to you, one on your right and the other on your left. But Jesus answered by saying to them, you don't know what you are asking. Are you able to drink from the bitter cup of suffering I'm about to drink? Oh yes, they replied, we are able. Jesus told them, you will indeed drink from my bitter cup, but I have no right to say who will sit on my right or my left. My father has prepared those places for the ones he has chosen. And again, just keep that scripture at the back, because the Bible answers who's going to sit there. It is very clear. And when we come, I want to come back to that uh, near the end of the, so it, it tells you who's going to sit at the very right hand of God. Okay, so my message is going to deal with pathway to glory. It's going to deal with um, the ministry of suffering. The ministry of suffering, a lot of uh, teachings within the church are or teach about um, overtaking the earth with power through, through maybe political power, all those kinds of things. There's many ways that you could think that God might work to overcome the world. But he always, see, God always seems to choose things that we would never think of. He always seems to go a route that, that just doesn't make any sense. And his route, his route that he wants to take for his church to to overtake the world and pull down the, 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 the governments and the principalities and the power is through suffering. The power of suffering, it's the power of the kingdom of God that brings glory uh, to his church. So Romans uh, 12, 19 to 21, well, I'm going to talk a little bit about how uh, service will release the spirit or suffering will re release the spirit. Getting a little slow with my Bible here. Out of practice. I should have just had him written down because I got quite a bit of scripture here. So Romans twelve, nineteen to twenty one. Okay. So here is Paul's teaching. He says, Dear, dear friends, never take revenge. Leave that to the righteous anger of God. For the scriptures say, I will take revenge, I will pay them back, says the Lord. Instead, if your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they are thirsty, give them something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on their heads. Don't let evil conquer you, but conquer evil by doing good. So what Paul is saying here, overcome evil with good, and Peter teaches this over and over again in, his, in, 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 the, in the epistles, in, in Peter's teachings. He teaches about uh, suffering, uh, more in his three and his two books uh, than the whole New Testament. He deals with it and he, he teaches about the importance of it. But what Paul is saying here is we need to re leave room for the wrath of God. We need to leave room. Now, we understand, I'm, I'm trying to talk about God's great grace and great mercy and how he wants so many people to enter the kingdom of God, but there is a place for the wrath of God, for the judgment. And when... What God wants us to do is to, when, when somebody comes against us, when somebody raises their voice or comes against us with whatever it might be, he wants us to leave room more or less for him to work. He doesn't necessarily mean that if somebody's going to come and be nasty to me that when they walk away he's going to strike them down with a lightning bolt. That's not, that's not how God works. You see, his, what he wants is to me, for me to react properly. He wants the way that I react to speak to that person, to speak to it, whether it's an enemy or, or somebody that, that is uh, thinking the wrong way or maybe, you know, a co-worker or maybe you just went to the store or, or the bank or something and whoever's working there messed up your bank account and, you know, and didn't treat you very nice. God wants, there's a special way that God wants us to act to release the Spirit of God. So if we retaliate, we do not leave room for God. This is the reason the kingdom has been slow to come. There's a, there's a scripture um, 
It's either Peter, I think it's Peter who talks about knowing about the things and we should be understanding what's going on, understand what God wants to do, and pray to hurry them along. And hurry them along. Paul says, uh, in what is teaching here, he talks about uh, a time when there's going to be a shift in what God is doing when the last Gentile comes. He talks about there is a specific time when that last one will come in and there's going to be a shift in what God is doing and he is going to move in to, to bring a new part of his kingdom. So these are the things um, that has been slow to come because the church has been slow to understand how God wants us to react to the world. So when we serve others, the Spirit is there with us, touching the hearts of the ones we serve. So serving destroys the power of darkness. So what happens is, when we, um, when we react in the same manner that someone is reacting to me, if I am uh, in a situation where somebody is in my face getting upset with me, and he's angry for whatever reasons it might be, might have a good reason, maybe I did something stupid, but he, he had, for some reason he's angry and, he's, and he's, he's coming down. If I, there's two things I can do. I can react with the spirit of God, or I can react with the spirit of darkness. So what happens is, if I turn to him and react in the same way that he's, doing, that he's acting to me, if I retaliate in anger, now I have just increased the hold of the enemy on him. I have just escalated the, the, the spirit of, 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 of the enemy in the situation. God is nowhere to be found. So what I've, what I've done is we've basically multiplied the spirit that is controlling this and has, have done him no good whatsoever because of, of a poor reaction. But God says, if I turn and I, and I speak blessing, if I, if I speak out of a kindness of a heart, if I speak uh, words uh, to uplift, to try to diffuse the situation, or even just take it without a response, God says, then, you can then the Holy Spirit is released. And when the Holy Spirit is released, when we, work, when, we, when we deal with things through suffering, when we deal with things through serving, through the heart of a servant, as Christ did when he was on the cross, we release the Spirit of God. We release the Spirit to work in that person's life. It says, you pour burning coals on his head. You bring guilt to him. You bring shame to them. Because they didn't get the response they were expecting. You know, you can, uh, you can just watch somebody's face when they're in there and they're just ready just to, you know, punch you out, and you say something that's completely out of what they were expecting, and they just kind of stop. <laughs> and normally what happens, not always, sometimes you still might get, you know, a black eye. But normally what happens is they just kind of, okay then, and they walk away. But a, but a kind word, but a, a, a gentle spirit if you can diffuse that situation through that, you have given the Holy Spirit of God room to work in their life. And then God says, what they do with that is between me and them. It's between myself and that person. What, what they do with, with the goodness that you've shown them, what, you've, what you, they do with that goodness is between God and them, whether they, you know, it, it can lead them into a relationship with God or whatever, if you have some kind of relationship with that person, Maybe you've just increased or, or made that a better relationship so that you can speak uh, the kingdom of God in their lives. So when we suffer for Christ, the Holy Spirit rests upon us and flows out of those um, who are persecuting us and in turn allows the Spirit to minister to them. So, what we, uh, so when I talk about suffering, I'm not necessarily talking about you know, you think of suffering, you think of the poor, in the poor countries, you know, the hungry. I'm not talking about general suffering. What, I, what the word is talking about here is suffering in response to my work for the kingdom of God. So that when I go out, when I go out and I, and I do something for the kingdom of God, whether, whatever it may be, the response that I get, an adverse response I get, that, that's what he's talking about, that persecution. Because when Jesus was going out and doing his work, he had, he had um, much um, adversity. He had people against him all the time. 
He was constantly, constantly being bombarded by, by the religious and all those things. And, and he had to, and he, come to, he was to the point where he understood how to diffuse those situations. Though there was a, I mean, I don't have the wisdom of Christ. I don't know how, <laughs> if I had to deal with that, or Paul, or Peter, or all those who had that, that type of adversity. That is what God wants the church to learn. That is what God wants, and not just an individual, not just me, not just one person or two, the church. When God is speaking in his word, he is mostly talking to the church. He, 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 it sounds like he's speaking to one, because we are one. Because if we are one in mind, we're in one in spirit, we're one uh, together under God, and he speaks to us as a whole when he speaks in his word. He speaks to us as a church. If we can get this as a church together, as a congregation or as a group of people, if we can get that, the power that we will have within the world to save will be unstoppable. Because we're going forward in the, in the fullness power, full power of Christ. That's why Jesus said, all these things, the greater things you will do. Greater things you will do because there will be this, this huge this huge group of people all doing the same thing that I'm doing now. Only you'll be going out in, in masses. You'll be going out and taking the world uh, because you understand uh, how Christ served, how he, he defeated the, the principalities and powers to, to, to bring in the kingdom of God. In Luke 23, I'm not going to go there, uh, 41 to 47, it talks about just, just when... Just after Jesus, you know, he gives his spirit up to the Lord, and there's a, there's a centurion there, a centurion soldier. Now, I'm pretty sure that this soldier has, had probably crucified, who, who, know, who knows how many hundreds of people. He's probably a really fierce warrior. He probably goes out and does battle in, 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 the, uh, uh, in the battlefield. Probably a man that's very hard heart. I mean, you have to... To, to do the things that they sold you, you have to harden your heart to a point against what you're doing. But he knelt down, and, and, and when Jesus died, he knelt down and said, surely this, must, this was the Son of God. What gave him that revelation? What gave him that revelation? He watched the whole thing. He saw how Jesus dealt with what was going on. He saw what, what the thing, he heard the things that he said. He saw how the people treated him and how he didn't react. How he didn't lash out in anger. How he didn't, didn't demand, I am the son of God. How dare you do? He did not demand. And through Christ's suffering, he brought salvation to this, this battle-hardened warrior. It just flowed out of him while he was on the cross. So what has happened is, when, as Jesus was, was ministering through suffering, through what God had, had, had for him to do, he was allowing the Holy Spirit to go out and work in the hearts of that, that Roman soldier. The Holy Spirit was given permission to go. Go and minister to this man. Draw him into the kingdom of God. Show them how we are, because it's only the Holy Spirit that can bring the truth. Not only to us that know him, but to those who do not. The Holy Spirit can speak to those who do not know Christ. I'm a living testimony of that. Before I gave my life to the Lord, the Holy Spirit was relentless with me. He would not leave me alone. He, tra he tracked me down wherever I went. Whether I was at a party, whether I was in the bar, whether I was you know, on whatever drug of the day we were doing, whatever I was doing... Because he had visited me one day. One day I went to a church service and the Holy Spirit of God came. And he visited me. A supernatural visitation. I didn't know that's what it was, but that's what it was. <laughs> but, what a, but for two years I ran from it. For two years I just went out and just lived my life as I did before. Nothing changed except... 
the relentless love of the Holy Spirit. The relentless love of God continually coming after me. He'd never stop. I would break out and he would come over me while I was sitting at the, the, at the table at the bar with all my friends and I would begin to weep. And I would have to get up from the chair and run outside or into the bathroom or something and get a hold of myself. Whoa, what's going on? I would be at, we'd be at parties, we'd be doing, we'd be uh, whatever it is we were doing and I'd be asking all these questions about God. I'd be asking about this and, and about that. I was asking all these people who had no clue. Like, they didn't know any more than I did. What? They just thought I was crazy. But somebody was listening. And Jesus, God says, I will not turn my face away from someone who's calling on me. I was asking all the wrong people. I was talking to all that had no clue to, to how, how to help me. They were just, yeah, they just kind of, I think you're too drunk or whatever it might be. What's the matter with you? But God was listening. And the Holy Spirit of God would come. And he would minister to me. I didn't know that's what he was doing, but that's what he was doing. He was calling my name. He was calling me. He was calling me. He was calling me. And I believe he was calling me because there were those people out there who knew God who were praying for me. The prayers of the people for those who do not know him cause the spirit to go out. Cause the spirit to go out and begin to, to draw the people in. We need to be continually crying out for those who are, who are lost and who do not know the love of God. We need to continue to cry out to God for the spirit to go and minister to them. And learn to even know how much uh, I lived with... Uh, my sister and my brother-in-law, and I wasn't uh, the greatest of uh, people to, to have living in your home. But they were very graceful. They were, I, I, I know there was a few times that uh, when, I was, when I was doing some stuff, my brother-in-law, I think he was hanging on to, the, to the, the railing of the stairs. I'm pretty sure he cracked a couple of them while he was trying to control himself because he was getting a little, but he never reacted. He never reacted. He always just continued to pray. He continued to, to try to do whatever he could do. And it's these things that uh, God honors. When all we want to do is see somebody set free, when all we want to do is see somebody who is struggling with whatever it might be, addictions or, or in a bad relationship or, or just lost, not knowing what to do. There's so many people suffering with depression and all those types of things. And all God wants his people is to have a heart to say, how can I set this peace person free? And so when you get a, a, a whole church full of these of people with the hearts that have been broken by God, who want just to see the people set free with, with no other reason, no other reason, but we just want to see you experience the love of God. We want you to experience and see what he can do in your life. See how you can, he can turn you around. There's, there's testimony after testimony come out of this, this place about the goodness of God, about the power of God in their lives, how he, how he changed their lives. To some people just, just at the, you know, right at the door of death, that if they would have just kept going the way they were, they wouldn't be here. And Jesus has come in and snatched them out. And gave them life. Uh, Ephesians 3, 10, 11. Uh, I want to know Christ and experience the mighty power that raised him from the dead. I want to suffer with him, sharing in his death, so that one way or another... I will experience the resurrection from the dead. Sound familiar? <laughs> I don't... Uh, seems like that was just read a little while ago. <laughs> so Paul is saying here, I want to know Christ. I want to know him. And like Pastor Terry said, I think Paul knew him. <laughs> I've read about what he's done. I, it, it seemed like he kind of knew who Christ was. It seemed like he, he worked a little bit in his life. 
But yet here's Paul still, I need to know him more. There were a lot of times people we get people get criticized because you know we reuse language like we're, we're going for God. We want to know him more. We want to we want to you know we want to dive in deeper. And sometimes people say, Well, what what do you you can't do? But Paul, Paul, he was as deep as you can get. But yet he said, I need to know more of him. And he didn't mean this. He didn't need he didn't need mean I need to have more information. He didn't mean I, I just have to have more words in my head so I can show everybody how brilliant I am. He says, I need to know God here so I can save more of those people out there. You see, Paul's heart, when he went out, first out to the Jewish, he tried to reach, reach them with everything that he had. With everything that he had, he reached out to them. And finally it came to the point where he said to them, you know, I have given everything. If I could give up my salvation, if I could give up my place in heaven, I would do that if it would make a difference in your life. That is how he, and, he, and I believe he would have. But he says, nonetheless, you have, you have rejected the God that loves you. And my hands are clean because I have done everything, everything that I can do to try and reach you. And he was, even, in, in, even when he was speaking to them in this way, he was still trying to reach out to them, still trying to, to bring life to them. And Paul, and like I said, he, keeps, he cries out, I want to know more. I want to suffer with him. Like he, you, you talk about strange. I want to sh- suffer with him. I mean, who wants that? Who, who wants to suffer? I mean, it makes absolutely no sense unless you know God. Unless you understand the power that comes from, from, from completely um, losing yourself. Completely losing everything, every selfish motive, everything that, uh, that you hold on to that, that separates us from God, that causes us to, to step back because, no God, you can't have that. Because... Because I, I, I want this. Paul says, I want to suffer more. I just want to lay everything out before him. And I want to live. He lived life. And life abundantly. Paul, uh, the other disciples, Peter, Jesus, they went through a lot of painful stuff. Yet there's no regrets. They would do it again. They would do it, they would, if it came up again and they were given another chance at life, I'm sure they would just go hard again and try to, to rescue as many people as they can. So the church will defeat the spiritual powers. Jesus achieves victory over, over them when he suffered and died on the, cross, on the cross. Evil will not be defeated by force, but by suffering. And again, what I mean by suffering is as we go out and do the work of preaching the gospel and discipling the nations, the suffering is the resistance we get to that from the powers that be, whether it be uh, groups of people, whether it be governments, whether it be uh, principalities and powers, whatever it may be, these things are going to come against the church as it starts to go forward. As it starts to go forward, we can see it even in, in our governments. You look over into Europe and, and many places where, where they just want a secular society. You know, no religion, nothing. Can't even wear a cross. Can't you know, have a, a ring with a cross or whatever it may be. We don't want any of that stuff. Well, we don't either. We don't want the religion part. We want, but, but they take the life of Christ. They try to take the life of Christ right out of their country. The only problem is, when you begin to suppress the Holy Spirit, he doesn't suppress that easily. He still lives among those who know him. And you see in countries where the, 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 the greatest, you look at China, you look at some of these nations, where the greatest suppression of, of Christianity is against them. And the power of the church is amazing. 
It is amazing. Why? Because they understand what Paul was saying here. I want to suffer more for Christ so that I can bring more of the kingdom of God to this world. It is the power. It is, it is how we get glory. So when we sing, <laughs> show me your glory. Be careful. <laughs> Jesus glorified God by suffering and dying on the cross to bring life to a world. We need to understand when we're proclaiming things, when we're asking God to do something, when we're asking God to show us who He is, to make us more like Christ, to show us His glory. I think sometimes He just kind of looks at her, really? <laughs> you really want that? And He's free and willing to give that to you. But it comes at a cost, it comes at a price. Because the, the church of God that lives and breathes uh, through the power of the Holy Spirit has taken the place of Christ here on earth to bring the kingdom of God. We are the salvation to the world. We are the light to the world. We are the ones that walk this, this earth and, 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 and tear down the principalities and the powers, and even stand up against the governments of the day. I'm not talking about violence. I'm not talking about taking a guns and, and, and bringing them down in violent ways. But we stand up and we declare. And we declare that Jesus reigns in this nation, that Jesus, and we live that life. And we continue to declare it until, until the principalities and powers take notice. Until they begin to to understand that, that finally maybe the church has woken up. And they are starting to take their place. We need to, to continually get revelation from God. I mean, we have a whole book of revelation from God. And it's all... But we need to... We need revelation from God from, from the, the people that he has put there, put in place to lead the church. The prophets and the, all those people, we need that revelation. Proverbs 29, 18 says, where there is no revelation, the people are left naked. My translation said, where there is no revelation, the people go wild. Because they have no direction. They have no direction. We, what is God trying to do on the earth? What is God trying to do on the earth? People keep asking, it's, a, it's, a mis it's not a mystery. It's spelled out in here. It was been a mystery to me for a long time because there was, it was just confusion. Just everybody saying everything. <laughs> and, I, and I found, I, I've been spending a lot of time in, in the last three months in Ezekiel and in Daniel and Revelation. I don't know why, because I, was, I just was frustrated. And I was reading it, and I was praying, and I was reading it, and I wasn't getting anything. It was just... And then one morning, I sat down on my computer before I went to work, and I went uh, where I do my studying, and he began to unload on me. And the whole kingdom of God opened up. There was something... There was, there was something blocking what he's my knowledge of what he was trying to do. And it, mostly it was my desire to know what he was trying to do because I was looking everywhere. I was taking in this and I was taking in what and what and it was just blowing my mind. But then he just began to say, look it. It's easy. It's not that hard. Just take a look. Just take a look and understand what, who I am first. You need to understand, before you can understand who, what this says, what's going to happen, you need to understand who I am. What is it I'm trying to do? What is it I'm trying to do with this world? What is it I'm trying to do with my church? And that's when it, you know, it opened up. I read, I read scriptures in here. In Revelation, you know, a lot of the teaching talks about, oh, there's not going to be many on that day when we're all going to be taken up in the air. Heaven's going to be empty. And, and, and I'm not mocking because I believe that 
for so much of the time, but, but I would read in there and they would say that I saw that, that uh, John saw a vision and at the, at the altar of God, there was numbers that couldn't be counted. Numbers that couldn't be counted. There's seven billion people in the world. They can be counted. How many people can't be counted? Heaven is full. And they're, and they're the ones just waiting. They're just waiting until God, they're not, not everybody's here yet. Wait there for a while. And it's incredible. You know, to, to think that when you read through here and over and over and over and over, God just wants everybody to know him. He wants everyone to have life. He wants everyone. He is not sitting there waiting for the day. Oh, oh, oh judgment day, I can't wait. He is waiting for the day that his church takes its place. He is waiting for the day where we come to a point in our lives and, 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 and as a fellowship, as a body, or whatever, however big or that looks like within a nation, that we figure it out. We are it. We are the ones that are going to bring this kingdom. And that's how God has planned it. He planned it right from the beginning. He wanted Adam and Eve to look after the earth. He wanted Adam and Eve to rule it. When he brought them in front of the earth and he said, all this is for you, he just said, go. He didn't give them any rules or anything. He just said, go and rule the earth. <laughs> Glad I saw her with a stepdaughter. <laughs> but he just, he just laid it out before them and said, this is yours. To rule. And so what happened was Adam and Eve went from when they fell, when they, when they, when they uh, were deceived and they were forced to leave the garden, they, they, they moved the authority that God had given to them to rule the earth over to our enemy. And that is why we're in where we're at. But Jesus, Jesus bought that back. Jesus bought that back. You see, we, we no longer, the only power that the enemy has on earth is deception, to try to, to veil the people's eyes from the gospel to be set free. That's all he has. Okay, he, he tries whatever he can do. Now, he can do some things. There's, you know, I can't, I'm not an expert on Satan. I don't study about him all the time. But he, he can do some stuff. Like he can do some stuff. He can, you know, he can cause us some trouble. He can make us, uh, he can have us do things that, that we probably don't want to do if we listen. If we listen. But if we do not believe, if we believe that we are just here for a time and then when, when it starts to get tough, we're out of here, that's how we're going to live. That's how we're going to live. We're going to be lethargic. We're going to, you know, I, I, many times we, we talk, I've talked to people about things, about the kingdom, and they said, well, it doesn't matter because Jesus is going to come back right away. Anyways, you're going to be gone. And so the kingdom doesn't get built. We're just waiting. We're waiting. We're waiting. We're waiting. We're waiting. We're waiting for him to come and take us out of here. And he said, there, come on, get to work. Like Terry said in his vision, get to work. You have a world to take over. You have a government to run. You have people to, be, to set free. Oh, where do I want to go now? <laughs> well, yeah, that could have. So through the whole book of First uh, Peter, Second Peter, all through that, he talks about the suffering leading to 
to God's victory in his church. That when we, when we respond to evil with blessing, when we, in 1 Peter talks about, well, we'll read it, but he talks, he, he's speaking to the people and he says, when we respond to ev- evil with blessing, when we respond to somebody coming after us in response to our work of, for the kingdom, he says, if we respond to them with blessing, he says, we receive a blessing. You will receive a blessing, regardless of how, how they react to it. Regardless of what they say or how they react, it doesn't matter. You see, that's how God has given me a, a thick skin. Because I can, I can, as long as I uh, react to people and act to people in the, in the manner that he wants me to, whatever their reaction is, it's him. It's, it's you. He, I did what you asked me to do. I presented myself. I did what I was supposed to. I said what I was supposed to. I reacted uh, in blessing and tried to draw them in and completely ignored it. So now it's between God and them. And we continue to pray. We continue to work at the situation. And so we, we want blessings. It doesn't say what kind of a blessing. It just says blessing. Blessings are good, I guess. We'll take whichever kind of blessings we can get. But what I believe is that the, the blessing that we inherit, the blessings of God are unperishing, are, are, are stored in heaven where they cannot perish. I believe that when we respond in blessing, we see the Holy Spirit of God work and our faith is increased because we see God transforming a life and we just did whatever because the spirit of God is released I did I take no credit for anything when we do that and when we release the spirit of God who knows what he's going to do who knows what's going to happen so when, if we respond with anger and insults rather than receiving a blessing We block the Holy Spirit. He is unable to work. And what we are doing now is we are working against God and what he is trying to do in that person's life rather than working for God to try to do what he's trying to do in his life. And not only that, we we strain, like I said, we we increase the evil intent because now anger, I'm responding to anger with anger, which is the enemy's territory. And when we start to respond in the way that the enemy would like us to respond, now we are submitting some of our authority over to them. Over to that, a foothold. He's able to get a foothold on you. And if we do this enough times, pretty soon he's got so many handholds and footholds on you that you can't even move anymore. And it, uh, and it takes a, it's time for repentance. It's time for, to turn back and because all God wants is us to realize, even if we, we, you know, spent the whole year just destroying people, <laughs> all he wants us to do is to turn back and say, okay, let's try this again. Because his grace and mercy is never ending. So suffering in Second Thessalonians one three to six. Did I do that? No. Is how we live a holy life. We talk about holiness. We want to be holy like God. And again, the pathway to holiness is the same as the pathway to glory. It's through giving up our lives. So that's basically all suffering is. Sometimes when I, when I say suffering, we're sitting there thinking, oh, we're walking around, we're bleeding all over the place, and we're, you know, we're hungry, we got nothing to eat, we got no house, whatever. We're just, that's not what we're talking about. Suffering, all it is, all the, all the suffering that the, this is talking about is we've given up our life. When Jesus suffered and, and was whipped and... and, and and punished and, and hung on the cross. 
His suffering was he gave up his life. He gave up his life for the plans and purposes of God so that God would be glorified and he was made holy. And when it was all said and done, he was sat down at the right hand of God. Okay, I was going some First Thessalonians. Thessalonians. Second Thessalonians. That's even harder to say. One, three to six. Second Thessalonians. Three to six. Dear brothers and sisters, we can't help but thank God for you because your faith is flourishing and your love for one another is growing. We proudly tell God's other churches about your endurance and faithfulness in all persecutions and hardships you are suffering. And God will use this persecution to show his justice and to make you worthy of his kingdom for which you are suffering. In his justice, he will pay back those who persecute you. And God will provide rest for you who are being persecuted and also for us when the Lord Jesus appears from heaven. He will come with his mighty angels in flaming fire bringing judgment on those who don't know God and on those who refuse to obey the good news of our Lord Jesus. So what he's saying here to the, in this letter, he says, in verse 5, he says, and God will use this persecution to show his justice. God's justice. What is God's justice? God is, will punish. It's clearly, it, but his justice God's justice was he sent Jesus to the cross to die for my sins to balance the scales. You see, when, you, when you look at, uh, you know, you go into a, a courtroom or whatever, you'll see the scales of justice. You know, and the scales of justice are there. It's, it's to represent, you know, I've done something wrong, so, you know, I'm on the wrong side of the scales of justice. And they're trying to do something to me to bring those scales back up. To bring them uh, to the level play, whether they find me, whether they send me to jail, whether I have to do restitution, whatever it might be, they say, this is what you have to do to balance the scales of justice. This is how you need to pay for what you did to them. And Jesus said, this is what I'm going to do for what you did to me. I'm going to balance the scales of justice. And you are found not guilty. Because God's justice, God's justice always brings, always seeks to bring freedom. It doesn't seek to lock people up. It doesn't seek to, to, to punish people beyond all hope. Sometimes, you know, you know we, we look at God's justice and we, and <clears throat> we, we just, oh, if I was God. <laughs> That person would know justice. <laughs> but God's justice, he, he wants everyone to be set free. He wants everyone to experience what his son died for to bring justice to us. And to balance those scales and give us a fresh start, never having to look back again at what I was and who were the things I've done he says, without looking behind, press forward. Keep your eyes on Jesus, who is your justice, and continue to follow. So these things are easy to read, but they're hard to do. Because if we try to do these things on our own, it is impossible. It is impossible... For me to wake up one morning and say, well, I'm just going to be Jesus to everyone. I'm going to go out and I'm going to save the world. And then you don't even get past breakfast. Because <laughs> the dog did something or whatever. <laughs> Can't even bring justice to the dog. Because our plans and our, we want to do good. I think the heart of pretty much every person, there's something there that wants to do good. 
They want to go out. They want you know people come to uh, come to know God and they get it within the church and the, and then they read the things. Oh, I want to do that. But we stumble and we stumble and we fall and we stumble. The only way to this is through deeper relationship with God. You know, brand new believers. You know, you come in. You know, coming though, some of them might be able to handle it. <laughs> I've seen some pretty radical transformations where they, you know, they come in dying and they go out breathing fire just about right away. <laughs> but for the most part, when, when somebody comes into the kingdom of God, it takes some time. It takes some time for, you know, the old way of thinking to be taken out and the new system to be brought in. So that God begin to download. We need to, to, to continue to pray. We need to continue to pray for new believers and, and anybody who's struggling for a stronger measure of the Spirit. We continually you know, speak to the Spirit of God to go into people's lives and to work and to reveal and to, to show them. Because that is the only way that we can have life. Because with me standing up here talking, it's just information. Sometimes there's a lot of information. But when the Spirit of God is involved, it can go deep down. And you might not even remember most of the information that was spoken to you. But God says, this is what you need. I'm going to stick it right there. This is what you need right now. Just take that. And we, and we get a little bit more life. And we begin to speak. Or we begin to... to, to to have a better real understanding of who God is. See, when I first got saved, just after, when I finally turned to him, after he, he kept pursuing me, his spirit just, it just manifested, it just multiplied. I've, for the first two years that I was, it, it was just constant, constant, constant. It, it, sometimes I just, okay, <laughs> slow down a bit. But for whatever reason, I don't know why that happened with me. I don't know why I couldn't, I'd go to work and I'd have to, you know, deduct two hours from my time, go to my boss and say, I got to take two hours off my uh, timesheet because I spent two hours in the electrical room over there talking to God. Now, he was at our church, so I could say that to him. But, the, you know, it was times that he continued to say, I, I, well, I was working, and he would just continually speak. He would just continually, he would just continually unfold who he was. And that's, and that's what he wants to do. He wants to unfold who he is to you, to each one of us, so that we have a, an intimate relationship with him, so that now when I come in uh, to a group of believers, whatever it might be, a church service, maybe going for coffee with, with some brothers and sisters of the Lord, maybe whatever it might be. You know, church is where two or three are gathered. And if the two or three are gathered are th full of the Holy Spirit, then heaven breaks out. Kingdom stuff happens. We begin, instead of, instead of speaking of gossip and backbiting and complaining and, and tearing down, we speak life. We speak, we speak things of God. We, we release the Holy Spirit. Even though there may be nobody around, we still release the Holy Spirit. Uh, I can re remember when Robbie was first starting to play the piano and, and start to sing. He would be playing and, you know, hitting the clunky notes and he would be stopping and starting. But the anointing of God, <laughs> I, like I couldn't believe it. Here it is, it's, he's not even singing, he's not even making music yet. And the glory of God filled the house. And, it, and, and things like that that I, that I would see and I'd say, wow. And I just said, God, you're so good to us. You want us, to, you, you want us to know you so intimately. So that when we get to this point, now when, God, when I said that God speaks to the church as a whole, when he, saw, he, he speaks to the individual as well. But when he's speaking to me, it's so that I will turn to those around me and bring life to them. And they life to me. And as breath came into them and they lived, they stood to their feet, an exceeding great army. We sang about that tonight. And he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. 
They indeed, our bones are dry, our hope is lost, and we ourselves are cut off. You see, it just, boom. What were they following? Like, who, who, what seminar did they go to? The Holy Spirit of God came down and just, whoop, transformation. Sometimes we think we need to, we do, I do stress that sometimes in our relationship with God, it does take steps, it takes time, but sometimes I think we just got to believe that He can do it. That He can transform a life. That He can transform my life in an instant. That He can take me from death to life. New. That terrorized me. I didn't, I missed out on all kinds of jobs because I was too afraid to go in. It was just fear. Because I didn't want to look stupid. And God said, well, there wasn't fear, then it was pride. It was pride that you were dealing with. Fear was just a manifestation of that pride that you didn't want people to think whatever. I didn't know what I thought. I looked back and I said, well, what were you thinking? Like, that is, is just stupid. <laughs> like, when you look back and see what God has brought you from, you look at what? What, what was that? Who was that guy? But I read the book of Revelation. And I understood it in a sense that I was in big trouble. <laughs> I, I read this and I said, uh, there's something not good in here for me. And that is what I, what, what I folk, I would have dreams about these crazy bees coming out of the ground and stinging me and all this kind of, oh man. So um, basically, that drove me to God. He basically, he scared the hell out of me, if you want to know what I've <laughs> tried to say. Because I was so in so much fear. And that's when I began to talk. Like, I would talk to the guys at the bar, at the party. What do you know about this stuff? <laughs> you know about, like, I was just reading it as literal. I was just reading it as what it said. You think that's going to happen? <laughs> But it was that fear that continued, that I continued to read this, even though I didn't really know what it meant. It was that fear that continued me to seek God to find a way out of this. And it was through that fear that I turned and I found the God of love. And all that fear was gone. Because I understood who I was now. So through the theme through Revelation... It's not about attaining the kingdom through political power or strength or might or anything like that. Rather, as Christians take up the cross of suffering, the political powers will collapse, allowing the kingdom to emerge. Revelation in the kingdom of God is not about escaping what is coming, but receiving the kingdom through endurance and suffering for the gospel as we are led and empowered by the Holy Spirit. Now that's a really, 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 really quick overview. <laughs> the kingdom of God is about receiving the kingdom that has been bought and paid for for us. That we have a legal right to. To go out and bring life to the world. And when the church goes out in the power and in the love and the great um, As the church goes out into the world through the power and the love that the, that the suffering, that, that giving up of ourselves, allows God to work through his church. If we could, if once we figure that out, once we get that in here, where we've completely given up ourselves, and we begin to walk out, things begin to happen. You see, the, if you read through here, it talks about the bride being prepared. It talks about it getting ready. It talks about things that need to happen, that the church needs to do in order to receive the kingdom. In order to be in the position to go out in, those, in, in that power and that strength to go out and, and stand up against the governments of the day that are trying to oppress Christianity and all those things. If you want, I spent two days reading testimonies from the chi Chinese church. If you want to see what it looks like, just go on there and start reading them. Because it's happening. 
You know, we can sit there, what does this look like? It's all, it's, it's, it's happening. It is happening in many countries where they have nothing else. Where they have nothing else. Where they're, they're not even allowed to gather. They're not even allowed to, to, to have a church service. Their pastors are in jail. Their, their leaders are in jail. They're suffering. They're, and, they're, and they're responding in the way that Paul and Peter and Jesus did in the Bible. And they're bringing down and, and, and they're transforming lives of the soldiers and those, the army, and those people that are coming against them. They're looking and they're seeing these goofy people just living their life like, like Christ. And they're entering the kingdom of God. And the kingdom of God is expanding. And the kingdom of God is growing. And the kingdom of, of God is, 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 is working as it says it's supposed to. Jesus came and he, the story in Daniel where, where he was the rock that destroyed the governments of the world. The rock came that was cut out of the mountain and it smashed the feet of the statue and toppled the... the the, the, the authorities of the world. And he says that rock turned into a great mountain that covered the whole earth. That's us. That mountain is us. Jesus started the church by defeating the principalities and powers on the cross. And then the Holy Spirit of God came down on Pentecost and the kingdom of God came. The kingdom of God was ready to be set up on earth. It's taken a while, but the promise hasn't changed. The plan hasn't changed. He is still waiting for his bride to prepare herself. You know, all those, you know, you read those about the, uh, the, the foolish virgins, all of it's talking about that time. I guess I better, like I said, I could go on a million rabbit trails here. John's reason for writing the letters to the seven churches was to encourage them to endure through their sufferings. When we focus on the faults of the various churches, we miss something important. Jesus is encouraging his people to endure suffering in the, in the uh, face of hostility. See, a lot of times when and I've taught out of the church and I've focused on, oh, look at this dumb church. Look at, the, look at all the things they're doing. You know, and then you say, oh, the hell to God, whatever. But you need to read the end, where, God, where the promises of God start to come out to, the, to those who endure, to those who stand fast, to those who hang on, to those who continue to, to, to fight the good fight. Ooh. Okay, let's close this off here. Letter to the church that we all don't want to be. <laughs> but really we do when you hear the end of it. It's incredible. It'll go back and answer the question that Jesus, that the, the, the two disciples asked Jesus about who's going to sit at your right hand. Revelation 3, 15. Write this letter to the angel of the church in Laodicea, to the angel. This is the message from the one who is the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's new creation. I know all the things you do, that you are neither hot nor cold. I wish that you were one or the other, but since you are like lukewarm water, neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. You say I am rich, I have everything I want, I don't need a thing. And you don't realize that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. So he's, so he's saying this to them. He's, he's saying this to him, I believe, not because he wants to pass judgment on them. He wants them to open their eyes. This is where you're at. This is where you're at. You guys think, you, you think you're here, but really you're here. And, and I want, to, I want to, you to understand that. And even in our personal life, sometimes something gets pointed out to us. Somebody might stand up, well, sometimes our methods of doing that may not be the greatest. But sometimes if somebody comes to us in love and sees us something destructive, and they point it out, 
They pointed out the f usually the first thing, what's the first thing we do? Stop judging me. Stop judging me. And we, you know, we, ugh. See, that's not the response God wants. That's not why he's, 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 he's revealing this to them. It's not why he's revealing to them what's going on. So he wants them to open their eyes, look around, just see what you're doing. Line up who you are and how you're living to what my word says. So I advise you to buy gold from me, gold that has been purified by fire. Then you will be rich. Also buy white garments for me so you will not be shamed by your nakedness an ointment for your eyes so that you will be able to see. So again, he's given them the pathway to freedom. He's given them the way to get into the kingdom life. He says, now I've shown you where you're at. Here's how to get to where I want you to go. Here's how, here's how to get there. I correct and discipline everyone I love. So correction and discipline is part of the love of God because God's correction and discipline is always to bring freedom and to bring life and to bring, and pull people out of the things that they're stuck in. Correction and discipline is not to, 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 to beat the daylights out of the person so they can't function anymore and they just run away. What good is that? God's discipline is just to reveal our condition to ourselves, to open our eyes. I didn't know that. I didn't realize that. I didn't know I was acting like that. And once, once that happens, we're, we're on our way. We're on our, once we can just say, oh, I was mistaken. And we can repent, we can turn, we can get back. And God, all he said, okay, it's done, let's go. You know, we don't have to cut ourselves or, ash, or sackcloth and ashes and lay in the dirt for four or five days or whatever the whatever is required. He says, once you've figured it out, repented, let's get moving. Pick up your stuff, let's go. He says, look, and I stand at the door and knock. If you hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and we will share a meal together as friends. Those who are victorious, now listen to this promise. Those who are victorious will sit with me on my throne just as I was victorious and sat with my father on his throne. So who's going to sit at the right hand? On his throne. So you kind of think of that. Oh, he must have a strong lap. It's going to be pilots. There's going to be millions of people sitting on there. He's not really talking about the throne. He's, not, he, he's talking about authority. He's talking about ruling. He's talking about that place that God has brought Jesus to. Remember he said to Jesus, he says, I will put all of the earth under your feet. All principalities, all powers, all authority, I will put as your footstool. And who's sitting there with them with their feet on the footstool? His church. Those who understand the power of service and suffering. Those who understand how the kingdom of God is one. Those who understand how... The principalities and powers are, are defeated in the same way that Jesus defeated them. By stretching out his arms and say, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they've done. And we submit our spirit unto you, God. We don't have to die. We don't have to literally die. There will be, I mean, there, there are Christians dying all the time physically for their, their faith. We're not at that point. We don't have to worry about that right now. Seems to me that the Bible says there will be a little bit of a time of distress where we might have to think about those things maybe a little bit. But what he's saying is now. Now what he's saying to the church of Laodicea, you are comfortable. You have wealth. You have peace. You have blessings, and you've turned those blessings into something that has drawn you away from me. But even in, in those blessings, I'm not asking you to give those up. What I'm asking you to do is give yourself up. What I'm asking you to do is come out of, of that and all those things that you have held to your chest and clutched as mine, you turn over into the, to the kingdom of God. And as the entire church begins to turn over their lives to the kingdom of God, 
He refines them, puts them through the fire, and he puts his glory on them. And we're able to take our place, ruling and reigning with Christ, building the kingdom of God, bringing people until it does cover the whole earth. It says many, many places in here, right into the very beginning. It talks about covering the whole earth, covering that there will be as many as the grains of sand on the sea. And the, and, and the promise has not changed. Anyone with ears to hear must listen to the Spirit and understand what he is saying to the churches. What is he saying to the churches? His message is basically the same to all the churches in there. They got some things going for him, some don't. One church is pretty, is good. There's nothing going on. He said, wow, <laughs> you guys are good. <laughs> you know, and he says, hey, that's a good thing. We read that, we say, whoa, let's us be that church. These are the ones that did the things that God is asking the others to do, to come and receive the blessing of God. Jesus said, the kingdom of God is at hand. In fact, it is upon you now. It is still there. It is still for us to take. We need to, to, to call out to God. There is a part of the church that's missing. We still need to cry out to God. We still need to cry out to Israel. We need to shout. We need to call out, come forth. Come forth. Come forth and join. So the church will be made whole, be made one. There is a time and a place where that will happen. And then, I believe, that is when that, that huge, giant, worldwide revival, the kingdom of God, will begin to take place. When the fullness of the church is realized. Because he said, there, you know, there's no... Once, once that happens, he says, there's no difference between Gentile and Jew. Well, male and female, it's all the same. Once their eyes are opened... He says their eyes have been blinded in part. I never noticed that before. He says, I've hardened their, eye, their hearts and I've blinded their eyes in part. Well, that tells me is, and we see it, there's a lot of Jews who know Jesus. Not the whole nation has been blinded. But he says, once he lifts those blinders off, once he lifts those things. And so as a church, we need to continue to proclaim, need to cry out to God to build his kingdom. We are crying out for revival for, so that the Spirit of God will come and revive the church and, and bring new life. But I think there comes a time when we need to change that, that cry from revival to kingdom. Where we need to start to, so, because it's the kingdom that covers the whole earth, the revival will lead us into that. But it's the kingdom of God that is going to, 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 to bring God's glory to the earth. When the church is is in a place where it is raised to sit beside the Father, when we have the Spirit of living God living within us, when, when God has given us so much that we, that we are able to go out and, and, and just work in the kingdom as he has set it forth. So the challenge is to individuals. And the leaders of the church, all kinds of guys, people preaching and, and within this body, and they're, they're basically saying the same thing. Seek God. Go further. That's why they're, they're bringing out these things. They're teaching. They're trying to get closer to God. Reveal, revealing life. Take a hold of them. Apply them to your life. Allow the Holy Spirit to make them alive. And when we get together, expect great things. When we get together, expect God to show up. When we get together, bring the Spirit with you. Bring the Spirit with you, whatever it is, whether you have to you know, worship God for an hour before you come, or whatever it is, whether you've got to get into the Word, or whether you're just nice to your family, or whatever it might be. Bring the Spirit of God with you. And if everyone brings the Spirit of God with them, all of a sudden the Spirit of God is just all over this place. And heaven starts to break out, and the kingdom of God is ours to take. So I'll just uh, turn it back over to you. Praise the Lord. There's lots. The relentless love of the Holy Spirit. Um, the kingdom of God. God wants us to be a part of what he's doing upon the earth, basically. You know? 
He wants us to, I, I'm excited about that because that's what I live for. I live for that, I live for him, I live for helping people to get connected with him. And uh, we've heard a lot today about that and it's, it's, it's a good word. The kingdom of God. Become a part of the kingdom of God. Lay down your life, become a part of the kingdom of God and you'll never be boredom. How many, does anybody have a problem with boredom? You know, if you do... Just give your life to Jesus. That's all there is to it. You know, you can party, you can do drugs, you can do all that stuff, and you're, you're going to be bored all the time. As soon as the drugs wear off, you're bored. But Jesus, you get on something, and you never get that. I never have that problem. So being part of the kingdom of God, relentless love of the Holy Spirit. There's people in here that God has been chasing for a while, and he wants to touch your life. and. I think what we're going to do, we're going to open up the altars. We're just going to spin a disc, I think, you know. And um, if you need prayer for anything, let's stand. Let's close this off with prayer. And Darcy, I would like Darcy to pray for people tonight. And and um, I think some of the worship team, we should get some prayer tonight. And and um, lay, just just get some of this kingdom stuff. God is good. Amen. Place your hand on your heart or close to it or, and um, just, just repeat this prayer with me. Dear Lord Jesus, I want to be part of the kingdom. I give my life to you. I lay down my life and I'm willing to suffer for you. For yours is the kingdom that I want to live in. Yours is the kingdom that I want to serve. I need your life. I come to you today as a needy person needing your spirit and nothing else. In Jesus' name, I am yours and you are mine for now and forever for the rest of my days. I will never turn from you ever again. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so if you're the one that Daryl was talking to, maybe there's a couple about, you know, you've, been, you've tried this and didn't succeed. You need, you need to receive prayer tonight. You just come.